In the annals of music history, one name stands tall above the rest, Chet Atkins. His guitar skills were like magic. And with these skills, he crafted tunes that spoke to everyone's hearts. But as time passed, Chet faced tough times, and his star started to fade. But what struggles and challenges did this legendary figure actually have to live with? Join us on this gripping adventure as we delve into the life and tragic ending of Chet Atkins, Chet Atkins' early life. Chester Burton Atkins, fondly called Mr. Guitar, came into the world on June 20, 1924, nestled in a secluded hollow just a couple of miles away from the quaint town of Luttrell, Tennessee, in the rural landscapes northeast of Knoxville. In his family tree, music flowed like a river. His grandfather, a master of the fiddle, held the title of champion. Meanwhile, his father, James Arley Atkins, wore many hats in the world of music. By day, he tuned pianos with expert precision, and by night his voice soared in songs of faith, sometimes taking on the role of an evangelistic singer. His mother, Ida, had a knack for playing the piano and singing. This rich musical heritage laid the groundwork for the melodic journey that awaited the young prodigy, shaping his destiny with every chord and harmony. At age three, Chet could strum a tune on the guitar, fiddle, or banjo. At the age of five, his tiny hands found their way to a ukulele, becoming his very first musical companion. Strings often snapped, but young Chet ingeniously replaced them with wires from a screen door. When Chet was nine, he traded an old pistol and agreed to do some chores in exchange for a guitar from his brother Lowell. His early years were marked by poverty, a circumstance that instilled within him a deep-seated feeling of uncertainty. Reflecting on his upbringing, he expressed how their financial struggles were so profound that it wasn't until the 1940s that he and those around him even realized they had lived through the Great Depression. In his autobiography, Country Gentleman, penned in 1975, he painted a vivid picture of their humble beginnings and the pervasive impact of economic hardship on their lives. Despite his parents' separation in 1932, music continued to weave its way through Chet's life. With his brother, sister, and their stepfather, Willie Strevel, he delved deeper into the world of music, transitioning from the fiddle to the guitar, crafting melodies that echoed through the hollers and hills of Tennessee. Chet looked up to his older half-brother, Jimmy Atkins, who was quite the sensation, strumming his guitar on the National Barn Dance radio show. Later, Jimmy joined forces with another talented guitarist, Les Paul, forming an unstoppable trio. Like many young musicians of his time, Chet soaked up the sounds of the legendary Jimmy Rogers, but he also had an insatiable appetite for jazz and blues. Due to a severe asthma condition, Chet had to move to Fortson, Georgia near Columbus to live with his father. Despite his health struggles, Chet continued to be passionate about music. His asthma forced him to sleep sitting up in a chair to breathe better. On those difficult nights, he found solace in his guitar, playing until he drifted off to sleep holding on to it tightly. This nightly routine became a lifelong habit for him. During his time in Fortson, Atkins attended the Mountain Hill School, an institution steeped in history. In the 1990s, he came back to perform a series of charity concerts aimed at rescuing the school from being demolished. During his high school years, Chet found an unexpected practice spot, the school restroom, which had excellent acoustics. His first guitar was far from perfect, with a nail serving as a nut and a significant bow in the neck that limited its playable range to just the first few frets. Eventually, he upgraded to a semi-acoustic electric guitar and amplifier. However, due to the lack of electricity at his home, he had to travel long distances to find a place to plug in and play. One day, as fate would have it, Chet stumbled upon a fascinating performance by Merle Travis on the radio station WLW in Cincinnati. Travis's unique thumb and finger picking style left Chet spellbound. Unable to witness Travis's technique firsthand, Chet embarked on a journey to forge his own path. With determination and innovation, he crafted his own distinct style of picking. While Merle Travis primarily used his index finger for the melody and his thumb for the bass notes, Chet Atkins took a different approach. 
He broadened his right-hand technique by incorporating picking with his first three fingers, while his thumb handled the bass. Additionally, Chet drew inspiration from the single-string playing of musicians like George Barnes and Les Paul, carefully studying their techniques to enhance his own guitar prowess. This innovative approach would later become a hallmark of Chet's legendary guitar playing. Interestingly, Chet's musical journey didn't kick off with strumming the guitar. It all began when his older brother Lowell suggested he try his hand at the fiddle when he was just a youngster. Chet embraced the fiddle with enthusiasm, starting his musical adventures, from Knoxville to Nashville. In 1942, Chet Atkins dropped out of high school and pursued his passion for music. He secured a job at WNOX AM radio station in Knoxville. There, he showcased his skills on the fiddle and guitar alongside singer Bill Carlisle and comedian Archie Campbell. Chet also joined the Dixieland Swingsters, a lively swing instrumental group affiliated with the station. It wasn't long before Chet's guitar skills caught the attention of Lowell Blanchard, who promptly featured him on Radio WNOX's daily barn dance show, The Midday Merry-Go-Round. While wowing audiences with his guitar on the airwaves, Chet also dabbled in the world of jazz as a guitarist with the Dixieland Swingsters. As his reputation grew, Chet set his sights beyond Knoxville, making his mark at WLW in Cincinnati. After half a year, he decided to try his luck in Raleigh. There, he teamed up with Johnny and Jack before setting off for Richmond, Virginia, where he shared the stage with Sunshine Sue Workman. Despite his remarkable talent, Chet faced challenges due to his reserved nature. Heading to Chicago, Atkins tried out for Red Foley, who was about to leave his prominent role on WLSAM's National Barn Dance to join the Grand Ole Opry. Atkins made his debut at the Opry in 1949, playing with Foley's band. Additionally, he recorded a single for Bullet Records, a Nashville-based label, during the same year. This single, titled Guitar Blues, showcased some innovative elements, such as a clarinet solo performed by Dutch McMillan, a musician from Nashville's dance band scene, and was produced by Owen Bradley. Although Atkins initially had a solo performance scheduled at the Opry, it was eventually canceled. Eventually, Chet found himself at KWTO, a commercial AM radio station in Springfield, Missouri, where he struck up a friendship with C. Simon. Cy saw potential in Chet's talent and recommended him to different record labels. However, Chet's polished playing style didn't quite fit the mold of traditional hillbilly music, leading to his dismissal from the station. But every setback led to a new opportunity. Steve Scholes of RCA Victor recognized Chet's potential and offered him a recording contract, marking a significant milestone in Chet's musical career as both a singer and guitarist. Soon, a significant opportunity came knocking when Red Foley invited Chet to join him on the renowned Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, hosting the Prince Albert Show. Chet seized the chance, leaping towards a brighter future in the world of music. During this period, Chet had teamed up with Maybelle Carter and the Carter sisters and had relocated to Nashville. Initially recognized for his smooth and jazzy voice, he primarily focused on vocal tracks, but unfortunately none of them gained much attention. However, Chet's exceptional guitar skills started to overshadow his vocals, leading to more opportunities as a session musician. With the guidance of Fred Rose, a pioneer in early country music who played a significant role in shaping the careers of legends like Hank Williams, Chet began to shine as one of Nashville's premier session players. He contributed his guitar talents to numerous hits, including Hank Williams' Your Cheatin' Heart, the Louvan Brothers' When I Stop Dreaming, Farron Young's Goin' Steady, Webb Pierce's There Stands the Glass, and the Carlisles' Too Old to Cut the Mustard, among many others. Chet's instrumental guitar pieces became a regular feature on RCA Records, and under the guidance of Steve Scholes, he was being groomed for studio supervision. In 1955, Chet struck gold with his first country hit, Mr. Sandman, performed as Chet Atkins and his galloping guitar. Meanwhile, Chet's presence on the Grand Ole Opry stage solidified, and his instrumental albums like Fingerstyle Guitar, Session with Chet Atkins, and Stringin' Along with Chet Atkins were gaining widespread acclaim. Chet's influence on country music was profound. Initially, his guitar reshaped the genre, but soon he expanded his role to producer and record executive. 
While Scholes managed operations from RCA Victor's New York headquarters, he increasingly relied on Chet to oversee recording sessions in Nashville. These early sessions were often makeshift, held in rented garages or offices, using portable recording equipment. Harmony and Marriage Atkins and Jethro Burns, known for their work with Homer and Jethro, tied the knot with twin sisters Leona and Lois Johnson. The Johnson sisters were performers known as Laverne and Fern Johnson, collectively known as the Johnson sisters. Chet and Leona's long-lasting union served as a pillar of strength and encouragement for Chet throughout his illustrious career. Leona was a constant companion in Chet's life, accompanying him on tours and providing unwavering support for his musical pursuits. She was also musically gifted, showcasing her talents on the piano and as a vocalist. Together, they were blessed with a daughter who followed in her father's footsteps and found success as a musician herself. Chet Atkins named his daughter Merle in tribute to the influential musician Merle Travis, whose style inspired Chet to pursue excellence in guitar playing. Leona Atkins wasn't just Chet's wife. She was also a gifted musician whose passion for music influenced Chet's own compositions. Chet often performed for his wife, who would carefully listen and suggest any necessary adjustments before Chet played the song for the public. Her discerning ear and insightful feedback ensured that Chet's performances were always finely tuned and polished, reflecting their shared dedication to musical excellence. Together, they not only raised a family but also established a thriving music business, pioneering the Nashville sound. In 1956, Chet arranged Elvis Presley's inaugural recording sessions in Nashville, leading to the iconic rock and roll hit, Heartbreak Hotel. Recognizing the need for a dedicated recording space in Nashville, RCA decided to build a studio. And when it opened in 1957, Scholes appointed Chet as studio manager. With creative freedom, Chet began to experiment, pushing the boundaries of country music. To counter the rising popularity of rock and roll, Chet pioneered a new sound, blending country with slick, pop-infused recordings. Between 1957 and 1960, Atkins employed the Jordanaires, a renowned vocal group, along with a rhythm section on several hits, including Jim Reeves's Four Walls and He'll Have to Go, as well as Don Gibson's Oh Lonesome Me and Blue Blue Day. This marked a shift where country songs began to achieve popularity in the pop music scene. Atkins and Bradley played a significant role in this trend by taking charge of the production process and influencing the artist's song choices and orchestrations. This approach set a new standard in the music industry, prompting other producers in Nashville to follow suit. As a result, many country hits started to gain recognition and success in the pop genre as well. Atkins crafted his own records, typically exploring pop standards and jazz in his advanced home studio setup. He often began by recording the rhythm tracks at RCA Studios and then added his solo parts at home, carefully refining the recordings until he achieved the desired results. Guitarists from all backgrounds admired Atkins' albums for their innovative musical concepts and, at times, experimental electronic elements. It was during this time that he gained global recognition as Mr. Guitar, which even inspired an album titled Mr. Guitar, produced by Bob Ferris and later by Bill Porter, who replaced Ferris as the engineer. In late March 1959, Bill Porter assumed the role of chief engineer at RCA Victor's Nashville studio, which, at the time, didn't have a specific designation. This studio later became known as Studio B after another studio was opened in 1960. Porter quickly realized that the studio's acoustics needed improvement, especially its reverberation sound, which he enhanced using a German effects device called an EMT plate reverb. Porter's keen ear detected issues with the studio's sound quality, prompting him to devise a solution. He hung acoustic baffles from the ceiling and strategically positioned microphones based on the room's resonant modes. These adjustments significantly improved the sound of the recordings, leading to a string of successful hits. The Nashville sound evolved into something more vibrant and dynamic under Porter's guidance. In later years, when asked about his secret to achieving such great sound, Chet Atkins credited Porter acknowledging his crucial role in shaping the studio's sound.
Porter, in turn, described Atkins as respectful of musicians during recording sessions. If someone played out of tune, Atkins would address it tactfully and respectfully without singling out individuals. However, if the issue persisted, Atkins would request Porter to lower the volume of the problematic player in the mix. When Porter left RCA in late 1964, Atkins lamented that the studio's sound quality was never the same without him, emphasizing Porter's significant contribution to their success. When asked to define the Nashville sound, Chet Atkins gave a memorable demonstration. He reached into his pocket, retrieved a handful of coins, and jingled them around, proclaiming, this is the Nashville sound, shaping the musical landscape. Remarkably, even after 50 years, the essence of Nashville and country music's commercial world remains largely unchanged. Chet's influence extended far beyond his guitar prowess. Before his mentor Shoals passed away in 1968, Atkins had risen to the position of vice president of RCA's country division, a position he held until 1982. Reflecting on this achievement in 1987, he expressed some regret, feeling that he had been given the title in place of financial compensation. Despite this, he had brought numerous talented artists like Peter Frampton, Steve Howe, Yes, Dolly Parton, Amy Grant, Willie Nelson, and Waylon Jennings, among others, to RCA in the 1960s, inspiring and supporting countless musicians along the way. His innovative work as a producer and record label executive, signing unconventional talents, left an indelible mark on the industry. For instance, in a bold move during the turbulent mid-60s, Atkins signed Charlie Pride, country music's first African-American singer, to RCA. Despite the racial tensions of the time, Atkins recognized Pride's talent and welcomed him into the country music scene, showcasing his commitment to diversity and musical excellence. Despite his busy schedule managing RCA's affairs, Chet maintained a rigorous recording schedule of his own. He released a multitude of albums showcasing his versatility and creativity. From Caribbean guitar to Picks on the Beatles, Chet's albums spanned various styles and genres. He also scored several hit singles, including Poor People of Paris and Yakety Axe, demonstrating his ability to innovate while preserving the essence of melody. Chet's adventurous spirit extended to collaborations with diverse artists, such as Indian sitarist Ravi Shankar and guitarist Jerry Reed. He engaged in guitar duets with stars like Mark Knopfler, Les Paul, and Doc Watson, showcasing his willingness to explore new musical territories without compromising the beauty of the melody. Chet was unmatched as a guitarist, often compared to Fred Astaire in dancing, his fingers moved across the strings and frets of his guitar with such grace and ease that it appeared effortless. But attempting to replicate his technique proved challenging. His intricate finger-picking style, with his thumb handling the bass line while his fingers weaved intricate melodies and harmonies, has left an enduring impact on guitarists for the past six decades. While his music had a smooth and easy listening quality, mastering his style was anything but easy. When RCA's leadership shifted, and they resisted Chet's idea of making a jazz album, he decided to part ways with the label and signed with Columbia as a solo artist in 1982. This change breathed new life into his career as he ventured more into jazz and new age music. Adding the initials CGP, Certified Guitar Picker, after his name, Chet returned to the music scene with a bang in 1985 with Stay Tuned, a diverse collection of jazz-infused tracks featuring collaborations with modern guitarists like Earl Clough, Larry Carlton, Steve Lukather, and George Benson. Interestingly, these duets were initially rejected by RCA. His subsequent albums for Columbia, including Street Dreams, Sales, and Chet Atkins' CGP, continued to explore a contemporary jazz sound. One of his standout achievements came in 1991 with Neck and Neck, where he teamed up with Mark Knopfler, who not only produced the album but also lent his vocals. Chet's collaborative spirit extended to other artists as well, such as Australian sensation Tommy Emmanuel on The Day Finger Pickers Took Over the World in 1997, and Susie Bogus on Simpatico, along with Algerian rye singer Cheb Mami. A trailblazer in music. For 14 consecutive years, 
Chet Atkins dominated the Cashbox poll, clinching the Best Instrumentalist Award. His accolades extended beyond Cashbox, as he also earned recognition from esteemed publications like Playboy Magazine and Guitar Player Magazine, along with the prestigious Yamaha Music Award. Beyond his accolades, Chet's performances graced almost every major television show of his era. Atkins had the honor of playing at the White House for every U.S. president from John F. Kennedy to George Bush. Chet also collaborated with Arthur Fiedler and the Boston Pops for numerous concerts. Notably, at the age of 49, Chet became the youngest inductee into the Country Music Hall of Fame in 1973. Notably, in the early 1970s, he toured and recorded with Homer and Jethro, forming the Nashville String Band. Chet's influence even reached legendary artists like Paul McCartney, who sought his expertise for recording sessions in Nashville. Alongside Floyd Kramer and other accomplished musicians, Chet facilitated McCartney's recording of Walking in the Park with Eloise and Bridge Over the River Suite. Throughout his career, Chet's musical prowess garnered him numerous awards, including nine Country Music Association Instrumentalist of the Year titles from 1967 to 1988. In 1993, the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences honored Chet with its Lifetime Achievement Award, recognizing his unparalleled fingerstyle guitar technique, extensive discography spanning over 100 albums, and influential contributions to the development of the Nashville sound. Additionally, he amassed an impressive collection of 14 Grammy Awards, with his most recent win in 1997 for Best Country Instrumental Performance with the song Jam Man, featured on his album Almost Alone. Chet's Grammy legacy is rivaled only by Vince Gill in the country music realm. In 1997, Nashville inaugurated Chet Atkins Musician Days, an annual festival honoring Chet and benefiting the Chet Atkins Music Education Fund. This event draws a stellar lineup of musicians paying tribute to Chet, including Eddie Arnold, Mark Knopfler, Susie Boggess, Travis Tritt, Clint Black, and many others. Moreover, Chet's legacy is celebrated in Nashville with a street named after him in the Music Row area and a bronze statue depicting him playing guitar, symbolizing his enduring impact on the city's musical heritage. Chet Atkins' Tragic Death in 1973, Chet Atkins faced a challenging diagnosis of colon cancer and underwent surgery to remove the tumor, prompting him to reassess his responsibilities at RCA Records. He decided to delegate administrative tasks to others so that he could focus more on his true passion, playing the guitar. During this time, he frequently collaborated with artists like Jerry Reed and Jethro Burns from Homer and Jethro, especially after Homer's passing. Chet entrusted his administrative duties to Jerry Bradley, the son of Owen Bradley, at RCA. Throughout the 1990s, Chet Atkins persisted in his performances, but his health began to deteriorate once more following a diagnosis of colon cancer in 1996. Chet Atkins faced another health challenge when he was diagnosed with cancer in 1997. He underwent surgery to remove a tumor from his brain. Chet Atkins passed away at his home in Nashville on June 30, 2001, following numerous battles with cancer, when he was 77 years old. A memorial service honoring his life was conducted at the historic Ryman Auditorium in Nashville. He was laid to rest at the Harpeth Hills Memory Garden in Nashville. He left behind his wife, Leona Johnson, whom he had been married to for over 50 years. Chet often remarked that Leona was the only woman he ever went out with, he also left behind his daughter, Merle, and his grandson, Jonathan. Chet had a unique sense of humor, characterized by dry wit and clever jokes, which sometimes made people feel both amused and a little intimidated when meeting him for the first time. Reflecting on his career shortly before his passing, Chet humbly remarked to the Nashville Network, I may not be the most talented, but I am original. I've gained fame as a guitarist, I'll admit that. While I consider myself good, there are certainly many players better than me. I just happened to be one of the first. A Legacy of Music and Influence The following year after his passing, 
Atkins was posthumously inducted into the prestigious Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. During the induction ceremony, Marty Stewart and Brian Setzer presented the award, and Atkins's grandson, Jonathan Russell, accepted it on his behalf. Additionally, in the subsequent year, Atkins was ranked number 28 in Country Music Television's list of the 40 greatest men of country music. Furthermore, in November 2011, Rolling Stone magazine honored Atkins by ranking him number 21 on their esteemed list of the 100 greatest guitarists of all time. Physician and guitarist Jim Coleman, who was one of Chet's doctors, paid homage to him by recording an album titled The Guitar That Made America Great. This 15-song collection features iconic tunes like Mr. Sandman, Cheek to Cheek, and I Still Can't Say Goodbye. Coleman had the privilege of playing with Chet during his final public performance on June 12, 1998 in Knoxville. In the album's liner notes, Coleman shares Chet's connection to each song and sheds light on some of the unique guitar tunings used. He recalls playing the tribute album for Chet a few months before his passing and receiving Chet's response. You made a couple of mistakes, but nobody but me would notice. In 2010, Steve Wariner, one of Chet Atkins's many protégés, released Steve Wariner CGP My Tribute to Chet Atkins. This exceptional collection features original tunes written and played in the Atkins style, along with Wariner's interpretations of songs associated with the guitar legend. Being universally recognized as Mr. Guitar is a remarkable achievement in the country music world. Although Chet Atkins was primarily associated with country music, his influence extended far beyond. He was respected in the realms of rock and roll, folk, jazz, and classical music. Not only did his records sell worldwide, but he also designed guitars for renowned brands like Gibson and Gretsch. What are your thoughts on the tragic life and ending of Chet Atkins? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below.